In 5.2, we're going to begin a discussion of angles. In a trig unit and chapter, you have to have a conversation about angles because all about those angles are going to relate back to your trig functions that we're going to be looking at. So first, let's define some things that we're going to deal with. Um, we're going to deal with angles, the initial and terminal side. So I think a picture is what's going to help us best with that. So this side of the angle is known as your initial side. And then this side is known as your terminal side. Think about terminal as your ending point, And that's because this angle is going to start here and there. And we call this angle theta. Now, as we move forward, notation and labels and symbols are going to help you. So let's just kind of put those out here to the side. So some labels that we're going to use. If we do something like this, we call this a theta. These go back into your Greek letters. This is known as alpha, kind of a capital B with a tail on it. This is going to be your beta, gamma, kind of looks like a Y, and then we've got phi. And so as we continue through this unit, this chapter, these sections, we're going to be referencing these Greek letters. So I want to, you to have some of those out to the side. Now, let's begin into some other definitions. Let's talk about standard position. When measuring angles on a circle, unless otherwise directed, we measure angles starting at the positive horizontal axis and we move counterclockwise in rotation. And so let's make some key points here. Starting at the positive horizontal axis, you're gonna move counterclockwise in rotation. And so what we're gonna do is Say I have an angle, here's your x-axis, that's your horizontal positive axis. We're going to assume that it starts here, and then say we went up to here, this would be angle theta. Now, if we move in a clockwise rotation, that is known as a negative angle. So if I start here and moved in a clockwise, this we would say is negative beta, so that's how you're going to know the directions of them. So you want to assume that you're moving positive, you're going counterclockwise, but if they throw a negative on that angle, that's going to mean a clockwise rotation. So let's jot that down. A clockwise rotation is a negative angle. So whether it's positive or negative, it's going to show you the direction that you're moving. Degrees. A degree is a measurement of an angle. One full rotation is equal to 360 degrees. So one degree is one over 360 of a circle. And so if we're talking about starting here and going all the way around, that's going to be 360 degrees. Now most students love degrees, but in this realm and in this unit, you're really going to deal with your radians a whole lot more than you do degrees. So don't get too comfortable on that. This is just the nature of your trig. So the other measurement is radians. This is actually less complicated in degrees in many calculations. So that's why you're going to see it as we move forward. And so if I have um, an angle, let's call this one theta. We can see that the ratio of the length of the arc to the radius of the circle. So look at what this means. If I take this angle and then I create a circle of it, here would be my radius, my R, and then right here is your arc length, which is S. And so if you recall that your arc length, S, is the measure of the arc around the circle. Remember, around the circle, go back to geometry days, circumference is equal to 2 pi r. So if you're looking at your radian measure, that's going to be equal to the ratio, so fraction, 
of the arc length s over the radius. Now note, let's make a note here. Note, radians are unitless measure. Like it doesn't have feet, inches, etc. on it. Because they are a ratio of lengths, they are a ratio of lengths, and so we don't have to write radians. Just want to kind of note that out as we go. We're just kind of defining things to get us going. So let's look here. And let's look at something known as the unit circle. Now you are gonna have to know your unit circle. You're gonna have to know your radians, your degrees, you're gonna have to know angle measures. So we're gonna kind of work through this and see what we can do. So let's note some things as we go. So here is your zero. And we know that if we moved all the way around the circle, that would be 360 degrees. So we got zero, we got where 360 degrees is, same point. Now, we know, we're just gonna kinda work through this, that half the circle would be 180 degrees, just half of 360, and so if I went from here all the way to here, I would get my 180 degrees. So we got half our circle. Then, I also know that if I take 180 degrees and cut it in half, I would have 90. Or if I add 90 to 180, I would get my 270. I know that if I go halfway to 90, divide that in half, I get 45. You can see that 135 is halfway between 90 and 180. And then you can get these respectively as well. And so we've got all of our degrees and how I get those. Now, let's turn this in to radians. Well, we can see that, and we know from the circumference of a circle, that 360 degrees is equal to two pi. So if I start here and move all the way around, this would be equal to two pi. Now, if you follow that conversation as well, like we did with our degrees, halfway, moving this way, would be half of 360, so 180, so half of two pi would give me pi. And so I can also put that here and say that this is pi. Okay, well half of 180 was 90, so half of pi would give me pi over two. And then if this starts out and we go to half, and then one, and then all the way here to two, between one and two, right here at 270, that would be my three pi over two, or one and a half pi, if you want me to relate it to that. So I can find my four radians. Now let's think about this. If I take my circle, there it is in half, and cut it into four pieces, then I could say, okay, well, this is half. That's how I got that half in the three pi over two. Let's cut it into quarters there would be one fourth, and this would be three fourths, and then we get to four fourths, five fourths, six fourths, seven fourths. And so when I come in here, and I now take, get rid of that, and apply pi, then this would be one fourth pi, or pi over four. You'll see more stopped in. Three fourths pi, five fourths pi, seven force pi. And so we're able to take the unit circle, and we talk about being a unit circle because its radius here is a unit of one. If you take your circumference of two pi r and apply that radius of one, you get the full circumference to be two pi, and that's where we're getting that from. And so pretty interesting that we can take all of this and when we spread it into force like this in halves, we can get these measures. Now what I'm trying to show you is how we get this unit circle because you're gonna see a module within our Canvas course of just dealing with the unit circle because knowing your unit circle is gonna be beneficial for your pre-cal, but also as you move forward into your calculus.
So let's look at this one here. And so I'm going to take my same unit circle, and you can see that I have the half, fourth, you can see we cut it again, and we've got some of these other angles in here. And so I can take this circle, and instead of cutting it into fourths like we did before, we're going to break this one up, and we're going to break into six. And again, the whole conversation is how do we get all these measurements and how do I get all the radians? Because at the end of this, I want to be able to give you a blank unit circle and you be able to fill in your degrees, your radians, and know where those are because we're going to do a little bit more with this. And this is going to be really handy as you go. So let's start again. So I'm going to take my unit circle and I'm going to break it into six. And so here's half. And then I broke it into six pieces of that half. And so I created angles such as 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, and then we'll do the same thing below. So if I take my radians, this would give me 1 6, 2 6, 3 6, 4 6, 5 6, 6 6, and then I'm going to go over that 7 6, 8 6. 9, 6, 10, 6, 11 over 6, and then 12 over 6. Now, obviously, I need to reduce all these fractions down, and so you can see 1, 6, I could reduce down to 1 third, 3, 6, that was our half, 4, 6, I could say 2 over 3, 5, 6, 6, 6, that's just 1, 7 over 6, 8 over 6 would reduce down to 4 thirds, 9, 6, that would reduce down to 3 halves, 10, 6, that would be 5 over 3, 11, 6, and 12, 6, we could be 2. So then if I find that radian measure and apply pi to this, this would be pi over 6, pi over 3. We already know that that was pi over 2, 2 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 4 pi over 3, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 3, 11 pi over 6, and then you can see we're back to 2 pi. And so I want to work through this unit circle with you and show you how to derive all these. So then our end game, when we go back into our unit circle, and again, there's a whole module with that. There's some more help videos with that. If I give you a blank unit circle, you can identify all the radians and all the degrees on it. And then we're going to add something here to go with it in a little bit. So let's look at some more examples and let's look at our coterminal angles. A coterminal angle is defined as the angles that have the same initial and terminal side. And so they call those coterminal. So some examples of that would be like this. Here's my axis. Say I have this angle here of theta. This angle here of beta would be the coterminal angle because it has the same initial side here and the same terminal side here. So let's put some numbers with that. If I come and I have this angle here, this would be the angle of 240 degrees. Well, this angle right here of negative 120 degrees, because we talked about how when we move clockwise, that was our negative angles. Those would be coterminal angles. They are both starting on the x-axis on the positive side, and they both have a terminal side of the same. The same is true as say we have this one here. Say I took an angle. Now, you don't have to end at 360 degrees. Say I start here on my x-axis and I go around and in over here in quadrant two, and that's my angle of theta. Well, I could take that same initial and terminal side and create another angle, and I could look at it and say, well, let me consider this. I just want to go from here to here, let me do that in different color. If I want to start here and just go here without rotating, that would give my theta to be 360 degrees. I went all the way around 
plus 135, so theta was 495, because I looped around. Well, if I take this angle here and let's call it beta, well, beta just started here and moved this direction and stayed in quadrant two, that would just be 135 degrees. So you could have the situation of 240 and the negative 120, where you could have the part where you have angles that are rotating around. So here's how you're going to work through some of this. It says examples, finding coterminal angles. And we've got three examples to get us going here. Number one says find an angle theta that is coterminal to 800 degrees, where zero degrees is less than or equal to theta is less than 360. So what we want to do, and the best advice I can give you as moving forward, is to draw a picture whenever possible to kind of see what's going on here. So I'm going to draw my xy axis and I want to picture what does 800 degrees look like. And so if we take our angle and we start here, excuse me, if we start here and we move around, this would be 360 degrees. So if we keep moving around, this would give us 720 degrees, just doing 360 plus 360. And then moving up here, this would end our angle at 800 degrees. And so it says find an angle theta that is coterminal to 80. So we want to find, there's my picture, an angle that is starting here on the initial side and ending here on the terminal side. And it needs to stay between 0 and 360. And so what I can do is I can take out some of those rotations. I can take 800 degrees and subtract one rotation. If I subtract one rotation, it would give me 440 degrees. And so that would be starting here and moving around and ending here. That would be one at 440. But they want me to stay between zero and 360, so I'm gonna subtract 360 again, and that gives me 80 degrees. And so starting here and moving up would be 80 degrees, still coterminal, and still within our domain of theta. And so you can see how if drawing a picture that can really be beneficial because we can see we're still in quadrant one, so we're between zero and 90, and then we can also get to that point of 360 remaining in that domain. Let's look at the next one. It says show the angle negative 45 degrees on the circle and find a positive angle alpha that is coterminal in between zero and 360. So the best thing you can do is draw out first what you got. And so if I'm at negative 45, remember that means I'm moving clockwise. So I'm moving down negative 45 degrees. Find a positive angle that's coterminal. So I, again, I want it to start here and end here. And I need to be between zero and 360. So for this one, if I move in this direction, that would be an angle between zero and 360 because I can't be negative here. I gotta be positive. And to find that one, I would say, well, you know what? The entire circle is 360 degrees. So if I subtract out this little part here of 45 degrees, I would get 315. And so that would be the angle of moving all the way around. Let's look at another one. Find an angle beta that is coterminal with 19 over 4 pi where beta needs to be between zero and two pi. So let's think about this, 19 over four. Now we know that, move this up, we know that, here's our x, y axis, and we know if we go one full circle around, that that is two pi. Now 19 over four, if I take 19 over four and reduce that down as a mixed number, it would be four and three fourths. And so if I start here and move around, that's two pi. Go around again, now we're at four pi. Now we need to go to three fourths more. And so this would be 19 over four pi. You see how I got all those rotations? Just rotating by two pi each time. So if I wanna find one that's coterminal, terminal zero between zero and two pi, I would start here and I'm gonna end here so that I stay between zero and two pi. And so then you can see from my rotations, that would just be three fourths pi. But I wanna show you how I did it based off what we did on the first example. So I'm gonna take 19 pi over four and I'm gonna subtract out two pi. Subtracting out two pi, 
That would be like taking 19 over 4 pi and subtracting out, get common denominators, 8 over 4 pi. So that would be equal to 11 over 4 pi. Subtract out another 2 pi. Let's just use that 8 over 4 pi again. And that would leave you with 3 pi over 4. So I want to show you with a picture and subtracting and those rotations, how we could get down to another coterminal angle that is between 0 and 2 pi. Let's do this one here too. Find an angle that is coterminal with negative 17 over 6 pi, where our angle is between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, so negative, we're going to have to move clockwise. Let's figure out what we can do with this one. Now again, you want to take it back to your rotations. Now we know that if we rotate 2 pi, that would be all the way around. So let's just look at that number 17 over 6. Writing that as a mixed number, that would be, let's see, 6 would go into that 2 times. 2 times 6 would be 12. So 2 and 5, 6. And so that means that if I start here, and I move negative, I would have to go around 2 pi, and then I would have to go another 5, 6, so I'm over here. So that would be the angle of negative 17 over 6 pi. Again, the negative tells you the direction. So I need to find a coterminal angle, so again, it's going to have to start here and end here. That's between 0 and 2 pi. And so that would mean moving this direction and landing here. So we're going to be a little bit more than 1 pi. But you can do that by subtracting like we did before. So if I take 17 over 6 pi and I move it backwards. So let's add that 12 pi over 6. That would be like adding 2 pi and so reverting it. And so then that would give you negative pi, negative 5 pi over 6. Let's add another rotation to it, taking it backwards and that would give us 7 pi over 6. And that makes sense that we would go 1 pi and then another sixth to get us there. So I want to show you these examples and show you how we're working with them so you can kind of go back to this. And with trig, sometimes there's just different ways that you can approach angles and sides and etc. Get different angles, but they're same coterminal. And you can see our different approaches here with these four. Now, we move from degrees to radians, so let's continue this conversation and let's look at converting radians to degrees and then do some examples with it. And so how do we convert radians to degrees? Because in those examples we just did, we were with degrees on some, radians on some, but we were still just circling our center of our circle there. So here are the conversions you're going to need. 360 degrees we've already seen is all the way around and that's 2 pi. Half of 360 is 180, and so half of 2 pi is pi. And so really, this is going to be the best conversion for you because it's based off one unit of pi. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be setting up two ratios, and we're going to set them up with 180 degrees here and pi here because those will be equivalent. And we are going to use our cross multiplication skills in order to figure this out. So we're going to have to cross multiply. So let's look at a few examples. It says convert pi over 6 radians to degrees. So you're going to set up two ratios, just like your proportions you set up in grade school. So it would be 180 degrees and pi. And so what we're doing is we're trying to find the degree, so I'm going to put an x here. I know the radians to be pi over 6, so I'm going to put that here. And then I'm going to cross multiply to solve this out. And so I multiply this way, and then I'm going to multiply this way. So that would give me pi x equal to 180 times pi over 6. If I clean that up, that gives me pi over x equal to 180 divided by 6 gives me 30 pi, and then divide by pi. So I get x to be 30 degrees which makes sense if we go back to those circles we were working with two pages ago when we were at 30 degrees that was pi over 6. Let's look at the next one 7 pi over 10 that's not on that unit circle we were talking about earlier and let's set it up and so I'm going to come over here I'm going to say 180 degrees is equal to pi so I'm going to put my 7 pi over 10 here and I'm looking for degrees 
So in order to solve that, I'm going to cross multiply. So it gives me pi x equal to 180 times 7 pi over 10. So it gives me pi x equal to, well, 180, this 180 divided by 10 would give us 18. 18 times 7. So I have 126 pi. And then divide both sides by pi. And so we can see that x is 126. So we keep on using that 180 equal to pi in our proportion in order to solve this. So now let's do the reverse and let's look at some degrees and change them to radians. And so again, I'm going to set up my ratio. So that gives me 180 degrees and pi. So I'm going to do 15 degrees here. And now I'm looking for x over here, but same process. I'm going to cross multiply. So that gives me 180x equal to 15 pi. Divide both sides by 180. So I get x equal to 15 over 15 pi over 180. And then you always want to reduce to lowest terms. So that gives me pi over 12. Let's convert this one. It says convert 140 degrees to radians. So again, you're going to set up your proportion. So 180 and pi. I'm going to put my 140 here over 180 and put my x here and I'm going to cross multiply. So then that gives me 140 pi equal to 180x and divide both sides by 180. So I have x equal to, now you want to take 140 over 180, reduce that down and that gives you 7 over 9 pi. And so you're going to see practices like this in your homework of just converting from radians to degrees and vice versa. Now we kind of looked at art length earlier when we were looking at some radians. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of take a break from our radians and degrees and specifically look more at what we can do with arc length. And so we're going to pull some information here. Arc length is part of the circumference. So we're considering a circle. Its formula is S is equal to R times theta, where R is your radius, and theta is your angle, and it's going to be in radians. Now, I know students really love degrees. They dislike working with radians as much. But I'm telling you now that that angle has to be in radians as we move forward. So it says a circle has a radius of four inches. Find the length of the arc intercepted by a central angle of 240. So some key information. Radius of four inches. Find the length of the arc, 240. And so if I pull that information out, my radius is equal to four. I'm looking for the length of the arc, so S is equal to R theta. And I want to look at the angle of 240 degrees. So the first thing I'm going to have to do before I can even come over here and do arc length is I'm going to have to convert to radians. So that's kind of a little hidden thing that you have to do. Knowing that your angle needs to be in radians, you're going to have to learn to go, okay, I've got to first take 240 degrees and not just start plugging and chugging through your arc length formula. So we're going to start with what we left off with. So we're going to take 180 degrees equal to pi. We're going to set that up. We know that we have 240 degrees, so we want to figure out what that is in radians. So I'm going to cross multiply. So it gives me 180x equal to 240 pi and divide. Excuse me. Divide the wrong way. Got to get a little carried away there. 180x is equal to 240 pi. Divide both sides by 180. And so then that gives me x to be 240 over 180. That reduces down to 4 pi over 3. Now that I have that angle in radians, I can come over here and now execute my arc length. S is equal to R times theta. So S would be equal to R is 4. My theta is 4 pi over 3. So that would give me a length of 16 pi over 3. And if I punch that in my calculator, that would give me 17.6 
inches for the length of that arc. So if we look at a picture of our circle here, I have a circle of radi radius of four. If I take an angle and move it all the way around here, this was your 240 degrees. That means that from here all the way around, length would be 16.76. We've gotten quite a bit of data through this section. We're trying to give us a good basis as we move through this chapter five. And so this video is a little bit longer, but the end is near. Um, so once we get arc length, and we can talk about that length we just got of that 16.76, it moves us into another defining moment of your area of a sector. So area of a sector is if we have that circle like we were just looking at, and say we just wanna cut out a piece here, this area right here is your area of a sector. That formula is A equal to 1 half theta R squared, and to be consistent, again, that angle has to be in radians. That's how both of these last two formulas are set up with radians. So if you're not using radians, you're going to have some issues. So how can it be applied? It says an automatic lawn sprinkler sprays a distance of 20 feet while rotating 30 degrees. What is the area of the sector of grass the sprinkler waters? And so let's kind of draw a picture of that. So you've seen a lawn sprinkler. It sprays out, so it has... The sprinkler here and it sprays out and moves around and so it says it has a distance of 20 feet so that would be your 20 feet it rotates 30 degrees so when you got to have few sprinklers throughout your yard if you have a sprinkler system what is the area of the sector the grass that sprinkles so if I do its terminal side here we're looking for this area here now we've been working with circles so I'm gonna make it a circle so I'm looking for that green part. So the first thing we have to do is we need to convert that 30 degrees to radians. And we know, because we've worked with 30 degrees, that is pi over six. You can see that from earlier in the video. So I'm gonna take my area of a sector, one half. My angle is pi over six times my radius, so in this case 20, and square it. Use your calculator, use your pi button, etc. You end up with pi over 12 times 400. Again, putting all that together, that gives me, let's see, 400 pi over 12, which would be equal to 100 pi over three. That's an exact answer. If they ask you to round it to two decimal places, that would be 1.4, 104.72 feet squared. And so that is the amount of area that that sprinkler is going to cover. So we now have gotten arc length. We've gotten area of a sector. Next vocab that's going to come up from that is the angular and linear velocities. So let's look at what these two are. Angular velocity is your rotational speed. Linear velocity is your speed along a line, so it has that word linear in it. This would be equal to, the angular velocity is equal to theta over time. Now remember, this is going to be in radians per second, so you got to get used to those radians at this point. The rotations per minute, or if they switch it over, we can look at this as maybe degrees per hour, but all of this terminology is showing you rotational speed. If we're talking about speed along the line, we would say V is equal to S over T. Now this S right here, we've already seen previously, S is equal to R times theta. We just picked up that formula earlier. So converting this one maybe into a better form of all your variables, we would say V is equal to R times theta over T. And the units for this would be like miles per hour. You've seen that label or meters per second. And so we've got our two formulas here. 
we've got our angular velocity and we're going to use this one here, our linear velocity. So let's apply them. It says a water wheel completes one rotation every five seconds. Find the angular velocity in radians per second. Radians per second. And so let's pull out what we know. We know that one rotation is equal to two pi radians. And we know that that happens in five seconds. They told us that. So if we set up our formula here, we know that our angle is two pi, our time is five seconds, so that would be about 1.257 radians per second. So the key with that one is realizing that your rotation is two pi because that's moving completely around a circle. Almost done, two more things. Let's consider the relationship between this linear and angular velocity and then end with an example. And so let's think about what do we know when we're looking at these two linear and angular velocity. We know how we can find the formula that we just used in the last example. We know that V is equal to S over T. And we know that S is equal to R times theta. Three of those last formulas we got. So if we take theta over T and solve for theta, multiply both sides by T, I can get theta to be, then if I take my S equal to R times theta and plug in what theta is equal to, that would give me this. And then lastly, I know, you're about capped out here with knowledge. If you take your V equal to S over T and sub in now what S is equal to, cancel. We can relate all of those together in order to get this. Let's apply this. A bicycle has wheels of 28 inches in diameter. Probably gonna need that. A tachometer determines the wheels are rotating at 108 RPM or revolutions per minute. Find the speed of the bicycle is traveling down the road. So here we have an angular velocity and we need to find the corresponding linear velocity since the linear speed of the outside of the tires is the speed at which the bicycle is traveling down the road. So here's what we're gonna do for this problem. First thing we're gonna do is we're going to convert rotations per minute to radians per minute. We've learned we really like to work with those radians so I would say I have 180 revolutions per minute. So I have 180 rotations over one minute. So to convert that, I would say, well, that means we're going two pi radian in one rotation, right? Because the tire is a circle. Rotations would cancel, and this would leave me with 360 pi radians per minute. Just multiplying across the top, multiplying across the bottom. So next, I want to find the linear velocity. So going back up to our formulas, and the one we just derived, we're gonna use it. So I've got R, which was my Radius, well, we have 28 inches as our diameter, so cut that in half and you get 14 times 360 pi per minute. Multiply that, put that over one, multiply across your top and bottom, and this gives you 5040 pi inches per minute. And then lastly, 
We're going to find the speed as it's traveling down the road. So we are going to convert to miles per hour. And so I'm going to take 5040 pi, which was in inches per minute, and I'm going to switch that over. So first, I'm going to switch over that inches, and I know that 12 inches is equal to one foot. You may have done some of these conversions like this through some of your science courses. So inches would cancel. Now I'm in feet. Now I'm going to convert feet, so I know that there's 5,280 feet per one mile. So now I'm in miles. Now I'm going to deal with this minutes and convert it to hours. And so since minutes on bottom, I'm going to put minutes on top so they would cancel. So 60 minutes is one hour. So now I've got it down to miles per hour. I'm just going to multiply. So multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, divide, and this gives me 14.99 miles per hour. So this section was a lot. This was a long video. So hopefully pause, take breaks, come back to it. Try the homework. If you have any questions, let me know.